Hi everybody, it's Katie Snyder from Museum of the Grand Prairie in the Champaign County Forest Preserve District. And today I'm here to read you a story for Black History Month. And today's story is called Sit In, How Four Friends Stood Up by Sitting Down by Andrea Davis Pinckney, illustrated by Brian Pinckney. And this book takes place in the year 1960. So let's give it a listen. We must meet hate with love. These were Dr. Martin Luther King's words that got them started. Four hungry friends eager to eat. Each took a seat at the Woolworths lunch counter in Greensboro, North Carolina. David, Joseph, Franklin, and Ezell sat quiet and still with hearts full of hope, with Dr. King's words strong and close, they were college students with a plan. It was February 1st, 1960. So it was in February as well, just like Black History Month. This was in 1960. They didn't need menus. Their order was simple. A donut with coffee with cream on the side. Woolworths was busy, so the friends waited. Patiently, silently, without a fuss. They were the only black kids at the counter. David, Joseph, Franklin, and Ezell sat while everyone else got served. At first, they were treated like the hole in a donut, invisible. Others tried to ignore them. The waitress watched and refused them. This was a sign of the times, whites only. And when they say a sign of the times, they mean literally. There were signs on restaurants, in pools, on theaters, all sorts of places that said whites only, which meant if you were not white, you could not be served there, you could not go in there. This was the law's recipe for segregation. So this was, these were laws on the books in the South. These kind of things happen in the North as well, but those were like what we call de facto. They weren't laws on the books, but sometimes they happened anyway. Its instructions were easy to follow. Do not combine white people with black people. Segregation was a bitter mix. Now it was the friend's turn to ignore and refuse. They ignored the law and refused to leave until they were served. Those kids had a recipe too, a new brew called integration. It was just as simple. Combine black with white to make sweet justice. For them, integration was better than any chef's special. Integration was finer than homemade cake. Integration was a recipe that would take time. So they were breaking the law, but when there is an unjust law, the only way to change it is through protests that break the law. So David, Joseph, Franklin, and Ezell sat quiet and still with hearts full of hope, with Dr. King's words strong and close, be loving enough to absorb evil. They sat straight and proud and waited and wanted a donut and coffee with cream on the side. After sitting and waiting and wanting, a police officer came, but the four friends wouldn't leave. Hmm, guess somebody called the police. The police officer didn't know what to do. The students were doing nothing wrong. No crime in sitting, no harm in being quiet, no danger in looking hungry. The officer left the lunch counter without doing anything. The Woolworths man turned off the lights. He announced Woolworths is closed. So the customers left, including the four friends who went home to dinner where they were served first. So since the manager couldn't get the police to do anything, they just closed the restaurant. But the four friends weren't done yet. News had already spread about the sit-ins. David, Joseph, Franklin, and Ezell got their names in the paper. The next day, February 2nd, 1960, more students showed up at the lunch counter. Sitting still for what was right, no reservations needed at Woolworths, the students seated themselves. They were dressed in their best clothes. They were polite and determined. So now there's more than four friends at the lunch counter. 
No guesswork for the waitress. The young people knew the menu by heart. They ordered, no food came. So they sat in silence and waited and wanted a donut and coffee with cream on the side. The waitress, waitress reminded them whites only, but those kids wouldn't budge. They didn't move until they were served, they refused. All they wanted was some food, a donut and coffee with cream on the side. So now there's even more friends. To pass the time, the students read their school books. They wrote in their journals, they finished their homework, they didn't need to read the menu, so they studied for tomorrow's test. So there's even more of them, more students, and they're doing two things at the same time, aren't they? They're multitasking. What had started in Greensboro spread faster than a grease fire. There were lunch counter protests in Hampton, Virginia, Nashville, Tennessee, Montgomery, Alabama, Atlanta, Georgia, and many other Southern towns. If lunch counters could go from whites only to all welcome, if segregation could turn to integration, if black people and white people could break bread together, everyone would pass the test. Everybody would score high, A plus with that coffee, and cream on the side. So now look, we've got students sitting at the lunch counters all over the South. So when they say lunch counters, basically they meant restaurants. But many folks were not motivated to make that grade. As the sit-ins grew, angry people gave the students a big dose of hatred, served up hot and heaping, Coffee poured down their backs, milkshakes flung in their faces, pepper thrown in their eyes, ketchup not on the fries, but dumped on their heads. They yelled at the students, we don't serve your kind, go home, goodbye. The students wanted to lash out, but couldn't. They wanted to strike back, but didn't. Sitting still was so hard. Practicing peace while others showed hatred was tougher than any school test. I can understand that would be very difficult. Now there were news cameras filming the sit-ins and viewers at home watching it all on TV. The students were more determined than ever to show the world the true meaning of peace. So they sat in silence with hearts full of hope, with Dr. King's dream true and close. These were the words that kept them going. We must meet violence with non-violence. And that is what Dr. King taught. And we learned in a book last month about Coretta Scott King, that Dr. King learned that from the teachings of Mahatma Gandhi, who Gandhi led the civil rights movement in India. The students sat proud and still and waited and wanted a donut and coffee with cream on the side. Soon the sit-ins were getting bigger and wider. White students joined their black friends to protest the unfair treatment by restaurant owners who would not serve food to black patrons. They also opposed segregated libraries, buses, parks, and pools. In many other places that were segregated, theaters, stores, kind of amazing how many places, pretty much everything was segregated in the South at the time. Schools. With so many students gathered, people got scared there would be fighting. They were afraid of all those youngsters grouped together for a cause. Even though the students were committed to peace, the police now took action. They